Good evening. I am Anna Garcia Doyle, the Executive Director of the One Earth Film Festival. I want to welcome you to our virtual screening and discussion of Racing Extinction, which is co-hosted by the Chicago Public Library's Harold Washington Center. Like so many other events, this one's original context was upended by the pandemic. Its date, planned for March, its location, the Library Center's Pritzker Auditorium, and its timing to coincide with last winter's One Book, One Chicago selection, The Sixth Extinction by Elizabeth Colbert. We're glad to be able to finally proceed virtually this evening, and we'd like to thank Jennifer Lizak and her team at the Harold Washington Library Center for their partnership then and now for helping make tonight's event possible. So we anticipate that this evening will present rich opportunities for learning and a brave and safe space for our critical conversation around issues that matter deeply at this time in our nation and in our world. So this year's festival 2020 theme was and is the power of we. And this is reminding us that this pandemic uh, in this uh, pandemic and election year, that we can make change for our planet, both individually and collectively. One Earth's mission is to utilize the power of film to spark awareness and action on issues of environment and topics intersected with environment, including social justice, which is something that will be at the fore tonight. One way that mission is perhaps reflected is in this quote. I always wondered why somebody didn't do something about that. And then I realized I am somebody. So that's our invitation to you tonight, among other things, to realize that you are somebody and that you can do something. So moving along, um, just to share a little bit of what we can expect this evening as we're together, um, our evening will pl take place in four parts. So we're welcoming you now. Um, and just so you can uh, know later, our AV team lead, Garen, will share some quick Zoom basics, but for now, just know that uh, we'll all be muted unless we've been called upon to speak and that our chat box in Zoom will be used for our question and answer later on. The next part of our event after we finish doing our welcomes and introductions is to view the film, of course, um, and then we'll have a conversation and Q&A uh, with our wonderful panelists. It'll be facilitated by our wonderful facilitator who I'll introduce in just a minute, um, but we'll be discussing the film and its themes, including social and environmental justice. And then we'll end on the note of action. So if you're familiar already with the One Earth Film Festival, you know that um, uh, the film festival is not an entertainment. We certainly hope in some ways that you might be entertained, but in fact, this is a call to action. And that's really what we, we take it as. And so we invite you to that action as well. So we'll end uh, with some actions that you can take to maybe help be part of the solution in the areas and issues presented in the film. One last thing before we meet our facilitator and program participants, I'm really a big fan of making sure that we amplify that the 90 of us that are here together tonight can become an even bigger group. So if you're active on social media, tell people this is happening, amplify the community that we're building here right now, if you can. So I would now like to introduce Jim Harriet, our discussion facilitator for the evening. Jim Harriet has more than 25 years of consulting experience in environment, health, safety, and sustainability for Fortune 1000 companies worldwide. Jim has facilitated for the One Earth Film Festival since its inception, which is just about 10 years now. He walks the talk. He has been a vegetarian for 30 years and works tirelessly to clean up the environment, seeking leverage points to drive behavior change in companies and in individuals. Thanks so much for facilitating tonight, Jim. I'm going to hand it over to you. All right, there we go. Thanks, Anna. Looking forward to the movie tonight, and uh, thank you all for participating. I see we have more than 90 participants, and uh, thanks for checking in from where you are. We Lots from Illinois, but also lots nationwide, so it's a really good mixed group. And uh, also, if you could put in the chat now, just give us a sense of what made you come tonight. We'd love to hear some reasons. What got your interest? How did you get introduced to this in terms of, you know, what do you want to get out of the movie? What what you know, we'd like to know a little bit about that. So please fill up the chat box with that. And as, uh, as that gets going, uh, we'll read back some of the, um, what you're saying. Um, <clears throat> while we're waiting for those chats to come through, let's go through 
um, some of the ground rules or agreements that we want to have our discussion after the movie tonight about. So we've got seven listed here on the screen. These are all good behaviors you'd expect in any good Zoom meeting. This is no exception. So number one, we're going to approach the conversation with respect. Um, you know, everyone's got a valid point of view. Everyone's got a room to speak. You know, we're here to listen and learn. Um, and we're not going to be talking over people or, you know, finding right from wrong. Uh, number two, uh, put aside your preconceptions, please. Come with an open mind. You know, this is truly an educational, should be an eye-opening movie for all of us. Um, and um, I've seen it several times and my eyes keep getting open to it. So put aside your preconceptions and come with an open learner's mind. Number three, internalize what you've learned. So this is really not about your philosophy or about your, you know, your uh, political beliefs or anything like that. This is really about how can you take what you've learned here tonight and make actions out of it that'll make a difference. So that's what we mean by internalize what you've learned. Number four, uh, acknowledge your privilege. So one way to get at internalizing what you've learned is to have the humility to see, you know, here we are, we're in the United States, richest country in the world. You know, 5% of our population, we use 24% of the world's resources. You know, what about that? That's a privilege. Uh, you're going to see a lot of privileged people on the, in the film. Um, so just acknowledge that, that, that that's where we're coming from in general. Um, and uh, that'll be useful as we have the discussion afterwards. Number five, um, use I statements. Um, so don't we want to be hearing people talk about somebody else, uh, but, but really speak from your heart and from your experience. Um, and then get comfortable with your story, like where you've come from. I pointed out one that you're, you're, you know, most of you are from the United States and, um, you know, get comfortable with that fact and, and the responsibilities that come along with that. Um, number six, engage your active listening. So as Anna said, this is not entertainment. This is really um, uh, opportunities for action at the end of the, sh at the end of the movie. So um, engage your active listening. And finally, we're just going to have one person speaking at a time. Um, everyone's going to be muted. If you've got a question or a comment or a response to what we're talking about, please use the chat window and we'll get those on air as best we can. Um, and anything in the chat yet that we should, reasons why people are here? Sure, yeah. Jim, do you want me to just shout some out? That'd be great. Okay, so I, we have some, someone saying for critical actions that are needed, we have a bunch of folks who are um, getting extra credit for class, so that's cool. Um, somebody is attending from River Forest, Illinois, because this is an amazing film and um, they needed the continued challenge and inspiration. Um, and then somebody said um, they're really concerned about the environment um, and they're thinking about all the things they can do to ensure uh, a bright future for our earth. So these are just some of the things Okay. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, all right. So I want to introduce the panelists that will be part of our post film program. So um, on our panel tonight, let's see, I've lost the screen, um, is uh, Chuck Knapp. He's vice president of conservation research, research at the Shedd Aquarium here in Chicago. So Chuck, welcome. And we'll have a more detailed introduction from each of these three panelists after the movie, but I want to let you know you know, we brought some um, highly experienced folks to provide input. So Chuck, give us a wave. There he is, all right, Chuck Knapp. Number two, we've got Jingmei O'Connor. She's the Associate Curator of Fossil Reptiles at the Field Museum here in Chicago. And uh, Jingmei, give us a wave. Very good. And number three, we have Brian O'Neill. He's the Alliance Ambassador for the Alliance for the Great Lakes, again, here in the Chicago-based group. Brian, welcome. Give us a wave. All right. So thanks for that. So now I want to introduce the film. So Racing Extinction is a film that was uh, produced in 2015, and it's still very relevant today. It's about an hour and a half long, and its main point is that we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. So there's been five before us. You know, they'll talk about the dinosaurs being extinct and the other extinction events. And their point of the movie is that we are right in the middle of a sixth mass extinction. And we, in fact, are the, uh, the asteroid that's hitting the Earth, uh, the, human, the human race and all our consumption. So in the movie, a team of artists and activists expose the hidden world of extinction with never before seen images that will change the way we see the planet. 
So there's two main drivers that they're pointing to that drive extinction across the globe, and it's potentially resulting in loss of half of all species. The first driver is the interna international wildlife trade, which creates bogus markets at the expense of creatures that have survived on this planet for millions of years. And the other driver surrounds us hiding in plain sight, and that's a world the oil companies and the gas companies don't want the rest of us to see. They've got a technology, you can see carbon dioxide being exhausted into the atmosphere, and that will be a large part of this movie. And with that, um, I wanna hand it off to Garen, and he's gonna give us some um, Zoom basics, and then we'll launch the film. Garen? Garen? Yeah, hey everybody. Um, so just a couple of quick things. I know we've all been on Zoom for it feels like a lifetime now. Um, but just a couple things specifically for how this meeting is going to run. You might notice that everybody's audio is muted. That is intentional. Uh, we get a lot of dogs and children and uh, it's, it's just a lot easier to communicate through the chat. Um, right now, we love having this video call to see everyone's faces and really feel like we're still in community. Um, that said, in just a second, we're going to switch over to streaming the video and we are going to ask that everybody turn their video off so that we can optimize the quality and everyone can see the movie. Ideally is hope to how the filmmakers intended it to be seen. Um, we're going to allow for about two or three minutes for folks to work through that. Next, as I mentioned, we're going to be using the chat for Q&A. Um, again, it's just a lot easier to manage that way. And with how many folks we have on the call, it's, it's easier to see those questions and relay those to our filmmakers. Uh, if you're having any sort of tech issues, feel free to reach out to either myself, who's on the call. Um, there's actually two accounts that say Tech Garen. Feel free to reach out to either one of those. And then Sam is our other tech support person who is on the call. Uh, Sam, do you want to say hi real quick? If Sam's around, I'll let him hop on. And Anna, is Aaron on this call as well? No, not tonight. Okay, not tonight. Sorry about that. Um, so we have Sam and myself, so feel free to reach out to either of us. Um, and if you're having any audio issues, whether it's now, hopefully not, because hopefully you're hearing my voice, um, or at some point during the call, you can go ahead and check your audio settings by clicking that arrow next to the mute button. Um, and you can kind of filter through the audio settings and hopefully figure things out from there. Um, one other thing, once we start streaming the film, you may notice that you have some people's faces or even just names overlaid on your screen. In order to get rid of those initially, uh, you're gonna wanna hit this little minus button on top of the video. And that is really gonna help minimize uh, that window so that you can see the film on your whole screen. And then once we jump back into our panel discussion and Q&A afterwards, you can go ahead and futz with it and uh, use whatever view you like, whether you want to use speaker view or gallery view, that's up to you. Um, and that is about it. Without further ado, we will jump to Racing Extinction. I'm just going to uh, take this moment to ask everyone to please turn off their videos. And once we get enough people that have done that, uh, we'll jump into streaming the film. Good, I would like to introduce our panel now and we'll begin with some questions for them and then um, as uh, keep filling in the chat and you can ask questions of the panelists mm -hmm. as they occur. So um, first I'd like to introduce um, Brian O'Neill. Um, he's an Alliance Ambassador for the Alliance for Great Lakes, um, which is a volunteer program for people who are passionate about preserving and protecting our heritage. He also writes on a number of topics, including the politics of resource management. Uh, so welcome, Brian. Um, also on our panel, we have Jean May O'Connor. Uh, she's the daughter of an environmental science teacher. Um, she's also a vertebrate paleontologist studying the dinosaur bird transition, early evolution of birds, and the evolution of dinosaur flight. Um, she's also an adjunct professor at the Institute of Vertebrate paleontology and paleoanthropology of Chinese Academy of Sciences. So welcome Jing Mei. And third on our panel, um, we have Dr. Chuck Knapp. He's the Vice President of Conservation Research at the Shedd Aquarium here in Chicago. 
He oversees applied research programs in the Caribbean and Great Lakes region that address the most egregious threats to biodiversity. So Dr. Knapp, welcome. All right, I'll start with the first question for the panelists. Um, and then, um, as I said, please keep questions coming in the chat window. So um, my first question is for all three of you, and either one of you, anyone can jump in or I'll ask you individually, but I really want to know what you've seen in the past five years, since this movie was produced in 2015, what have you seen in the last five years that's either been the same continuation of what the movie's presented, or has been some hopeful solutions, or been going the wrong direction? Anybody want to take that one on first? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, just, uh, just kind of in our focus at the Alliance for Great Lakes, one thing that we do is we, we want to make sure that um, this bill called the Compact for the Great Lakes is passed, and that has a lot of regulatory impact on, uh, on overfishing, on just the usage of the lake, on protecting uh, from invasive species. And over the last few years, there's been kind of a push for deregulation that, and every year, um, a budget is attempted to be passed that defunds that. But what's been really interesting is in every state, um, no matter who, you know, no matter what party is running the government uh, in the state party, they push back against the federal defunding. And there's actually been kind of a bipartisan, multi-party push to preserve all of that, um, which, you know, is, is a little unexpected. But I think when push comes down to shove, people really start to understand the importance of protecting the environment. There are many people who don't and many people who are very short-sighted about it. But when you really get to the meat and potatoes of it, these things that people see every day that you know, have a big impact on their lives, there's actually been much more kind of a joint action than I would have, would have expected. Ah, nice. All right, Brian, thank you. Good to hear. Dr. Knapp or Ying Mei, any comments about what's been going on in the last five years in contrast to or, or in, similar to what the movie's theme is? Um, well, I think that globally, we've seen definitely a move towards more renewable energies. Uh, you know, I spent the last 10 years living in China and China as one of the world leaders in terms of using renewable energies. And that's great. Of course, renewable energies do come with a lot of problems that maybe we can talk about later. So it's not just the solution itself, but it is still good to see that people making a move to alternate energy sources shows that they are at least aware of these environmental problems that are going on. So I think that that's promising. We're also seeing improvements in technologies. Like five years ago, a solar panel wasn't able to generate the amount of electricity that it took to make that solar panel. But now solar panel technology is much better. So they can actually make more energy than it takes to make them. So again, these are improvements. Okay. Thank you, King May. All right. If, if Jim, if I may jump in about, um, you know, there are some contrast, contrasting benefits and, um, and uh, missed opportunities. So as an example, um, in Australia alone on the Great Barrier Reef, there have been five mass bleaching events in the last five years since this film was made. So um, global climate change obviously is having an impact there. However, um, we are seeing new methods for restoration. So we're using mo molecular techniques now to try to identify certain corals that are more, re more resistant to, uh, to global climate change that might have a higher thermal tolerance. And then we can target those species for restoration efforts. In fact, we're working on such studies at the aquarium um, throughout the Bahamas and the Florida Keys. Um, also, we saw you know, in the film the, the issue with sharks and um, what CITES can do um, and can't do, there, CITES is not, a, is not definitely a, a cure-all, but um, since that film was made, there have been over 20 additional shark and ray species that have been added to the CITES Appendix 2 listings. And so um, that's one potential benefit. Um, although a study just came out um, about a month and a half ago um, that demonstrated that there are shark populations across the globe that are still in decline. Um, in fact, in 20% of the reefs that were studied across the globe, there were um, very few sharks. However, on the flip side of that, there are some areas where if there are conservation uh, measures that are put in place, um, it demonstrates that, that a positive impact can be had. So there are shark populations that are doing quite well. Um, the Bahamas, close to the United States, is, is one of those examples. Ah, all right. Very good, thank you. All right, um, Brian, I wanna go back to you for a second and just ask you about um, commercial development in and around the Great Lakes. We know it's impacted animal life. Um, can you give us some key examples of that and some solutions? Yeah, absolutely. It was interesting, in, in the movie, one of the, um, 
one of the scientists who was interviewed, and I don't remember uh, their name, mentioned, you know, we're changing a lot of the Earth's chemistry. And one thing when you really study the history of the Great Lakes over the last hundred some years is we've done more than that. We've actually altered the, like, the fundamental bedrock geology of the relationship between the Great Lakes and the other water basins around it. Um, the Erie Canal essentially circumvented uh, the Niagara Falls and opened up the Great Lakes to the ocean. The reversing the, uh, if people live in Chicago here, the uh, Shipping and Sanitation Canal, which kind of reversed the river and pushed everything down, connected the Great Lakes Basin to the Mississippi Basin. The water flowed through a bunch of rivers. And before that, these, you know, these different water basins never really touched. And so there wasn't kind of an intermingling of, uh, you know, invasive species into the lakes or, you know, the other way around. Um, but since then, especially with the Erie Canal and uh, ocean-going ships and even kind of, uh, you know, inland ships um, with the ballast hold, where they pick up water somewhere in the ocean for the ballast and then dump it somewhere inside the Great Lake system, the St. Lawrence Seaway. All those animals can come into the, into the lakes and from the lakes the other way. And so you've had this kind of, just in the course of human shipping over the last 100 some year, or 150 some years, you've had erased you know, tens of thousands of years of geology that kept these, um, these systems completely separate. So just the amount of invasive species over the last couple generations, um, which has completely changed the ecology of the lakes, completely changed the, uh, the animal ecosystem of the lakes, has been enormous. And there's a lot of kind of, uh, you know, last gasp efforts to stop, say, you know, the uh, Asian carp from getting into the Great Lake system. But there's already been just an incredible amount of, uh, of invasive species based entirely on, we wanted to connect these two different water streams so that ships could go through and pass through. Got it. Yeah. So. Got it, okay, thanks. <clears throat> um, so Jimei, I've got one question I wanted to ask you. You know, we know that the U.S. is only 5% of the world's population, and yet we consume nearly a quarter of the Earth's resources. Um, so we can see that the U.S. needs to be and can be part of the solution. What do you see from your work um, um, that the U.S. can be and should be doing? Well, I think a major issue is to take responsibility for our part in a lot of these issues. You know, I think this film was really wonderful. These people clearly care about the environment who made this film. They had very good intentions, but I feel like there was not enough focus put on us taking responsibility for how we've contributed to this, to the demise of global populations. Like for example, you know, take whaling, right? There's very much like everybody wants to point the finger at Japan for the pro with problems with ex recent endangered populations of whales. But the fact was that Commodore Perry went to Japan and forced them to open because they were exploring the Pacific for whaling rights. They wanted to go there and whale because long before, okay, okay, let's back up. And then, so that's, you know, why we were there to begin with. And then actually whaling used to be, or eating whale in Japan was a regional delicacy. And it was after World War II that the American occupation government told Japan in the wake of World War II food shortages, you should eat whale. So that was all us. And now it's just kind of been this standoff where you can read about it online where the Japanese are like, the world is watching us and we just refuse to back down. So it just be kind of become this principal thing. But the fact is that all these whaling, these whale populations that are so endangered right now are endangered because of centuries of Western world whaling these animals into basically endangered or extinction. So. I think if we want to look to other countries, like for example, this population in Indonesia that's, that was you know, harming this manta ray population, these people are poor and they're looking for some way, like they said in the film, to educate their children. They just need to make a living. So if we, we cannot turn to the rest of the world and say, well, I know you have nothing but fishing these manta ray, but you can't do that. So you, sh you, know, you shouldn't. Like we really need to look at our own consumption because consumption is the number one thing harming the environment. And one thing that we don't realize is that we're all brainwashed to consume far more than we need. In the 1920s, there was a study where they realized that every week, like com factories could make everything that we needed to consume to like, to, you know, to make our basic necessities in a four hour workday. But the capitalists said, 
you know, we don't want to have, give people this free time. Literally, that's what they said. They actually thought that free time would lead to radical thinking. This was around the time where we first started being afraid of communists for whatever reason. And so they decided that we needed to keep people working for eight hour days. And the way to do that was to create additional demand for things we don't need. So that is when advertising, which had existed before, then started marketing. We need to use psychology to make people want more things. Like for example, razor blade companies, they were only selling things to half the population, to men. So they made up a campaign to make women want to shave their legs. Just, just, this was made by capitalists in order just to make us want to buy things. So we need to realize that our levels of consumption, which are driving, you know, which are driving all this deforestation and all these other problems that come from over consuming, come from the fact that we have been brainwashed to want more than we need. So we need to look at our lives and say, what, what can we do without? What is a luxury that we don't actually need? Think about the rest of the world who you know, doesn't even have running water. They live without so much. So we need to also see where in our own lives, we can give up a lot of things. Okay, beautiful. Well said, thank you. All right, we've got a question in the chat. So here's a challenging one for you, Dr. Knapp, um, at the Shed Aquarium. So how can the, how does the Shed justify keeping um, belugas, sharks, otters, penguins in captivity for human entertainment? What, uh, what benefit do we gain from that? Um, well, I would, one, say it's not human entertainment. I would say education. And much like the premise in the film in terms of how they use film to try to reach people. And um, as they said, a picture can be worth a thousand words. So I think seeing an animal um, and being able to look nature in the eye and have them then act on their behalf is something that um, zoos and aquariums are uniquely situated to do. If people don't have the opportunity to see these animals, um, and you know these films were stirring, but just imagine if you can see these animals and then you're told that they need help, and this is what you can do to help, which is what Shed Aquarium does. So, um, you know, in terms of the education programs that are surrounding, in terms of the research, the applied research that we do, it's all for the benefit of not only the animals in our care but their counterparts in the wild. Got it. Good one. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up, I wanted to talk, if any of the three of you on the panel have any insight into indigenous land management, I'd love you to add, answer this question. Are there any policy or program initiatives that you see in being important for indigenous land management? So, I mean, I can, so I have been, um, I've participated in land management, uh, it's actually marine management in the Philippines. And, uh, and that's a little different because they have certain islands are, um, they're locally managed. And so by providing the, um, like a decentralization of, um, of marine protected areas has enabled local communities to then manage their own resources. And so I, I've worked in that decentralized view and it's work. Um, I've also worked in the Bahamas um, again, more on the marine side um, in terms of um, providing people information that they need to manage their resources. So um, I haven't, I don't, I have less experience with the terrestrial indigenous land management issues. Um, only what I what I have read myself, but I know that there's a movement of you know try and what we've what we've tried to do in our research is um, not to go in as Westerners to try to invoke this is what you need to do. It's more of um, providing some, some assistance when needed, but really understanding that um, either indigenous peoples or not just indigenous peoples, but peoples that might be in, in, um, in, in countries that we're working in, we need to empower them and, let, and, and they are the true stakeholders and the stewards of their lands and waters. Got it, got it. Okay. Um, looking in the chat, we've got some requests for some more practical solutions that each of us can take on, uh, maybe without uh, having to quit our job and be a full-time environmentalist. Um, so let's talk about the Drawdown Project for a second. So if any of the three of you on the panel are familiar with the Drawdown Project, this, pro this question is really for you. Um, but can you share briefly with everyone what it is, what you feel about any of the solutions listed? Um, I'll just give a little background on it. It's based on a 2017 book um, by that same name, Drawdown. It's a New York Times bestseller. 
um, and it lists industry leading practices and technologies that are available today to reverse the buildup of carbon. Um, so with that as a background, what do you think of the solutions that are presented in there? Chuck or Jingmei or Brian, anybody? I'm sorry. Well, so Go ahead. Jim, just to, just to um, so just for people that might not be <clears throat> as aware, um, if I remember correctly, it's onshore wind turbines, uh, solar panels, reduced food waste, and plant-rich diets. Is that correct? Yeah, those are the top four that they list for the long term for the like the most dramatic changes to the environment uh, over the long term. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think you know if if everyone makes these even just small changes, the collective impact I think can be large. And um, what was mentioned in the film in terms of just if people reduce their meat consumption and dairy consumption, that can go a long way. Um, I think solar panels are great, but not everyone can afford these types of solutions, right? So. I think it's just, you know, people being able to do what they can. Um, and that might range from solar panels. It might range to just, you know, perhaps eating less meat or perhaps taking public transportation and, and driving less. But I think as, as long as everyone keeps it top of mind in their daily life, that would go, that, that would go a long way. Beautiful. Jing Mei, you were saying? Yeah, I mean, food waste is a huge problem because the problem is just twofold. You know, not only are we using the resources then to, to make this food, but then we're wasting it. And they say that in America, we waste enough food to like, I don't know, the, I don't remember the exact statistic, but to like feed, you know, a huge portion of the hungry world. So food waste is just, it's just such a terrible sin. So it's something that I personally like really, really try to avoid. Every once in a while, I waste something and it breaks my heart and I feel so bad. But, you know, that kind of, negative thinking being hard on yourself isn't doesn't help the solution you know like we all want to try so so hard and we want to make things better but sometimes just because it, it's so hard you know i'll say i'm not being very articulate but just this kind of worrying and negative feeling is that's a waste of emotion so you can take that energy and just use it towards something that's positive so you know eating less meat huge can make a huge difference not wasting food can make a huge another huge difference also how what food we consume can make a, another big difference for example i try to only eat organic and i know a lot of people think that organic is just some new kind of capitalist scheme like a new way to sell you something different but really you know we know about for example extinctions in the insect population and these things are often because of a lot of pesticides and things we use so if we eat organic we can avoid some of you know some of these negative chemicals that we're putting into the environment. We also can farm more sustainably. So I think that's something that's really, really important. And then also, again, like I said earlier, just reducing how much energy we consume because, you know, solar panels are great, but not every, like I live in an apartment. I don't have a roof I can install solar panels on. And, you know, solar panels also, of course, take energy to make. And, um, also, another thing that we really need to talk about is that all renewable en energy sources like wind turbines, solar panels, these things use a chemical called sulfur hexafluoride, SF6 for short, and this is 23,500 times more powerful of a, of a um, greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So when, for example, when Europe in 2017 started moving towards more renewable energies, it was the equivalent of putting over a million cars on the road because of SF6. So while renewables are important, we also must remember they're not the answer. And something that Bill Gates said, so you know, you don't believe me, that's fine, I'm just a paleontologist, but Bill Gates said there is no, there is no, like, there is no equivalent um, in renewables for our current industrial complex. So what, what we have now has to change. And it's not just a matter of, oh, well, instead of you know, having a car that's on gasoline, we have an electric car. That's basically exactly the same thing. Electricity produces 25% of greenhouse gases. And so there's another quote that I you know, love. This one, I'm not, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna botch like I did the Bill Gates one, I'm just gonna look at it. So Einstein said, no problem can be solved with the same level of consciousness that created it. So really for us to get out of this problem that we've dug ourselves into, we need a shift in consciousness. And this is something that is more important than anything else that we all really 
you know, look inside ourselves and see what we really want to make in this world and how we can change. Because, you know, I'm a paleontologist. I study extinctions, of course. No other mass extinction. Okay, this is number six. So you might think there's been mass extinctions, but no mass extinction has ever been caused by a single organism, let alone one that was conscious of what it was doing. So we need to use this consciousness no longer to you know, be digging our own grave, but to be able to create ourselves a new future. And it is possible because we are bright and loving creatures, but we just really need to shift. Got it, yeah, well said, beautiful, thank you. Um, before we get to the next part of the evening here, which will be what actions can we take to be part of the solution, which you touched on very well, Jingmei, thank you. Um, I want to give each of the panelists one more one more chance. If I haven't asked the right question, or if there's something you wanted to to, to share with us, um, so let's see. I'll start with you, Brian O'Neill. Is there anything you want to share before we get to the next part of the evening? Um, I guess before we get to the actions, um, just kind of going on what uh, what Jingmei was saying before. You know, there are a ton of huge actions that people can take, and I think you know we're going to have to. It's not just a matter of you know, every individual making the right decision in their lives because there are much bigger things, but there are different ways that you can go about uh, making changes. And I know we're going to get to the actions in a second, but one thing kind of along those lines, you know, there's a lot of cynicism around greenwashing corporations that have a commercial where they show like the sun smiling big as, you know, they're dumping toxic waste into the ocean at the same time. But the thing with greenwashing is that it's based on a certain kind of cynical idea of the market, which works in people's favor. Like, microplastics, uh, you know, have been a huge source of pollution and, and danger. And there were a lot of petitions around it and a lot of people who, you know, are signing things and that didn't really move the market until people started not buying it. And once people started saying, I'm not going to buy things with microplastics in it, the companies that made them weren't suddenly struck by a spasm of consciousness. They weren't suddenly, you know, they didn't necessarily realize like, okay, we've been doing something wrong. We have to do it right. There might've been an element of that, but they were losing their revenue. So, you know, the personal decisions that you make, you know, people are asking about practical things and there were some in the movie where people talked about uh, the way that the market worked and it reacts to people's actions. And the market is a very imperfect system that has led to a lot of problems. And, you know, I, you know, I don't want to get too deep into that, but it can also be used and almost used against itself if you want to, uh, if you want to take kind of a, a cynical look at it. Okay. All right, got that. Hey, Brian, I got a question for you. Yep. While, you while you got the floor, but M has written in a, a good question for you about the consumption and fishing of salmon, trout, and whitefish. Um, is that a problem? Maybe not necessarily of extinction, but uh, is it a detrimental effect on the environment? You know, that's, that's a really hard question because, you know, looking at it in a void, um, yes, it would be a problem. Uh, we had a lot of problems with overfishing in the lakes, especially a few decades ago. Um, one interesting thing, and I don't actually have a really great way to answer this, is that with the kind of, in, you know, the introduction of, of a lot of the invasive species, especially mussels, which have really wrecked the food chain, um, along with uh, certain kinds of eels, really weird gross fish with teeth where their head should be. Um, that's really hurt like the salmon and the whitefish and the trout populations in the lake. And so a lot of states have actually kind of pushed more fishing in order to get people more interested in protecting these species. And again, that's one of those weird things where you're kind of constantly making, uh, I don't want to say deals with the devil, that might be a little over dramatic, but you're saying, you know, here's a huge problem and maybe fishing, overfishing is also a lesser problem, but if we can get people to recognize the recreational benefits of protecting species in the Great Lakes, whether that's fishing for food or whether that's just, you know, going out on the boat, you know, with, with, your, with your buddies and a few beers, people start to pay more attention to the fact that these species are not everlasting. They can be destroyed by our actions. So Jim, and if, and if I could also um, add to that, so salmon are actually an introduced species in the Great Lakes. So salmons are, salmon's not, they're not from the area. Um, but you know, if you wanted to eat salmon, Pacific wild caught salmon is considered a sustainable source. Atlantic salmon is not. Um, so you can go to uh, Shedd Aquarium used to have a, uh, we have a, it's called Right Bite program, but a sustainable seafood program. You can also go to Monterey Bay Aquarium and uh, you can download the app, the app if you're interested in sustainable seafood choices. Um, but then the whitefish is a fish that used to migrate into tributaries to spawn. 
those, those migratory runs um, stopped. But then about 15 years ago, they started again. And most likely it's because we've been able to clean up some of the rivers and tributaries leading into Lake Michigan. Um, and we've also been able to um, connect these habitats again, because many of these hab habitats have been fragmented because of dams um, or culverts. But there are um, now rivers where you're seeing these, spawn these resurgence of Lake Whitefish spawning runs. Um, but then what's also interesting is you're starting to see, there, there still were whitefish that um, to, to this day, they spawn in some of the reefs in Lake Michigan, but now you're seeing native fish that are starting to adapt to other invasive species. So, you know, we've heard of the, um, the quagga mussels or the zebra mussels, where now you're having Lake Whitefish, which, not, which they did not used to feed on benthic species like these mussels. Now they're, eat, now they're feeding on these species. So whitefish are getting much larger. Same thing is happening with smallmouth or largemouth bass. If there are any anglers um, in the audience, they're getting record-sized bass because they're starting to eat the round goby, which is another invasive species. So, um, so we're starting to see these dynamic shifts that are happening within the trophic webs of, of, of the Great Lakes that we still don't quite understand yet. Um, but then also we're seeing a resurgence in recreation fishing, especially this year because of COVID. There have been 60,000 more fishing licenses which have been issued in the state of Illinois alone, which is actually a good thing because fishing licenses help support non-game um, and game um, fisheries. So it's actually a good thing to get people out there to enjoy because that's one, that's one of the reasons why, well, there are many, many factors that are impacting us right now, but it's a, it's a nature deficit disorder. So part of what we're doing at Shed Aquarium and part of our programs is just to get people outside. And so we have programs on Lake, uh, on the Chicago River, for instance, where we work with our partners at Urban Rivers, where we have a kayak for conservation program, where people can come out onto Lake Michigan and we have a restoration effort where we have floating islands and people can kayak and see what those islands are doing and help with citizen science programs. We also have opportunities to get people out into our nature preserves and cut down invasive buckthorn um, and we're studying how that is um, allowing an native amphibian populations to rebound. So, so anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent, but there are a lot of ways that people can get involved, but um, recreation fishing can be actually a, a very good um, thing for the environment. Yeah, okay, well, that was good. Uh, you touched on action items, and that's uh, what we're getting to next. Uh, before we do that, Jing Mei, any, any last thoughts before we start uh, giving the action items from people who are on the call? My main thought is basically um, what Brian already said about, you know, I have already, you know, in my long winded, very sorry about that answers <laughs> about, you know, how like capitalism is destroying everything, but capitalism, we have to remember it's made up of consumers. It's made up of us so we can drive it. We can change it with the way we consume, just like Brian was saying. So I think this like just segues into actions, but my main, you know, that's my main point that we really can change this and it is a form of action and it's the most important form of action in my mind. All right, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so for folks on the call, um, we'd like to know what actions you can see out of this discussion and out of your experience of the last hour and a half movie, what actions can you take to be part of the solution? Um, please type them into the uh, chat window and we'll call them out. Um, and, you know, yep, Brian says consume less. Certainly we heard, you know, to the extent you can, eating less meat and less dairy um, has protective effects on the environment, clearly. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and Ivy is saying share knowledge and resources, get trained, attend, attend one or film festival movies like, like this. Um, Absolutely, um, and then share that. Bring bring your friends and family to the next one. Um, participate in these discussions. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, keep please keep inputting that into the chat box. Um, and yeah, lo look at this. In the middle of COVID, walk, ride, bike, sew your own clothing, and keep wearing uh, keep wearing your old existing clothing instead of. Uh, thrown away maybe too soon. So a lot of that I've noticed has been happening since COVID. And yes, thank you for the slide here. Um, here are some suggestions um, which you can certainly borrow and steal and, and use to your own self, uh, for your own self. In two weeks, 
uh, from tomorrow, you get a chance to vote. So number four, make sure and get you and your friends and family out there and vote your principles uh, and vote for the environment in any way that you think you can. Um, <clears throat> Extinction Rebellion, I'd like to bring that up at the bottom there. Um, um, on Wednesday, the 21st at seven o'clock, there's a virtual event called Heading for the Coup and what to do about it. Um, so there's a website there um, or an email contact at XR Chicago, as in Extinction Rebellion Chicago.org um, that you can participate in. Um, <clears throat> Good, we've got another slide here on consumerism and project drawdown that we talked about. There's a link to that. If you want to see the table of solutions, you can sort the solutions by clicking the top of the table, the column headers, and you can get the most effective and the least effective uh, ways to do it. But we did tell you some of the most effective ways were reducing food waste. Um, that was one of them. I uh, can't remember the other ones right now but uh, that would be a good one. Um, cook more at home and purchase from local urban farmers. Good suggestion, Felipe. Um, I think I saw one fly by about when eating out, being, being aware of uh, endangered species that might be on the uh, menu. Um, get yourself educated before you go out and have seafood. Absolutely. On this slide here, we've got um, some links where you can follow us to be informed about future events. So we've got from our panelists for the Alliance for Great Lakes, the link there for the Field Museum, the Shedd Aquarium. Um, also, we mentioned the Extinction Rebellion. So there's their Facebook page, um, Harold Washington Library Center, um, tons of resources, and of course, the One Earth Film Festival. So, um, Lots of good suggestions still coming in. Almonds are bad for the environment, but it's not their fault. Okay, good. Glad we're not here. Sorry. Pick on the almonds. <laughs> but yes, yeah, super water intensive. Got that one. <sighs> Thank you. Um, let's see. All right. Um, so, I hope you were inspired um, and that you can take uh, at least one or more actions into your personal life starting today and tomorrow when you get out of bed, um, write them down, remember them, share them, make commitments, be in action. Um, that's the point of the film and of our One Earth Film Festival. Um, and with that, uh, I wanted to thank the panelists. So Brian, Chuck, and Jing Mei, thank you for volunteering your expertise and your time this evening, uh, we appreciate it. We respect all the hard work you're doing and, and thank you for the extent to which you're protecting the environment and reducing, reducing extinctions. Thank you very much. All right, and with that, Anna, I'll go back to you. Is there any closing thoughts that you'd like to share? Um, I don't really have anything except for a big note of gratitude to all of you. Jim really skillfully facilitated a really rich discussion. Uh, Brian, Chuck, Jingmei, thank you for sharing your knowledge, wisdom, and your passion and commitment to these topics. Tonight with all of us, I feel I've learned a ton uh, and I hope others feel the same. So just gratitude and also just hoping that folks, if you're new to One Earth Film Festival, that you can see now why, uh, why we do what we do, why uh, this works is because these films allow us to open a door and have a conversation. And that's really uh, where, where we're focused is not just the films, but to pair that with the kinds of conversations and actions that have been discussed tonight. So please join us for a future screening. Uh, we've got screenings all week with the fall uh, mini film festival from One Earth and you can check that out on our website. Uh, the link is right here in front of you. So thanks to all participants and all audience members. Really appreciate your being with us this evening. Thank you. <laughs>